Welcome to the award-winning Superhuman Academy podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to give you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. Before we get started, I want to take a quick moment to let you guys know about an awesome product I've been using. You see, if you've been listening to the show for a while, you know that it's really important to take good care of your skin, but that it's also really important to choose products that are all natural and free from harmful chemicals. That's why I was so excited when I discovered Caldera Labs The Good. Here's the gist. The Good is a one-step skincare serum for every type of skin, clinically proven to make your skin look tighter, healthier, and smoother. I've been putting it on every morning, and my wife is absolutely thrilled that I'm finally taking care of my skin, plus she loves how I smell too. To try out Caldera Labs The Good and get 20% off your first order, visit calderalab.com slash superhuman or use the discount code superhuman. That's Caldera Lab, C-A-L-D-E-R-A, L-A-B dot com slash superhuman. Greetings, super friends, and welcome, welcome, welcome to this week's episode where we are joined by Dr. Michelle Jorgensen. She is an author, speaker, teacher, biologic and holistic dentist, and health and wellness provider. After practicing traditional dentistry for 10 years, she became, as she will tell you, very, very sick. And through her own journey to return to health, she discovered many different ways that traditional dentistry and oral health have been failing us. For this reason, I wanted to have Michelle, who is a member of my private members only mastermind superhuman academy on the show to talk about everything that she had learned over the last 10 years. I wanted to learn what is the big deal about oral health? Why does it matter so much? Why does it seem to be such a crucial part of our health so much more so than we realize? I wanted to learn what are the misconceptions? What are the things we're doing wrong? How are we being affected? And how can we advocate for our own dental health if it's so important. I had a really, really good time in this episode. I learned a ton of different things that I should be doing differently or better. And I learned that a lot of the stuff that I've learned through past episodes was actually really, really good information. So that's always fun. I think you're going to enjoy and learn quite a bit from this episode with Dr. Michelle Jorgensen. Michelle, welcome. How are you? Very good. Thank you for having me on, Jonathan. I appreciate that. Oh, it's my pleasure. You know, your name has come up again and again, whether it's in Superhuman Academy Mastermind or uh, I got a copy of your book on my bookshelf. So I'm really excited to uh, learn more from you and hear about all the stuff you've been doing. Great. I'm excited to share. Yeah. So Michelle, tell us a little bit about your superhuman origin story. Um, How did you get interested in health and, and improving it? Well, I'm a dentist. Um, I grew up in a dental family. So my dad was a dentist. I have three younger brothers that are dentists. So that's just what we do. And um, I was pretty much following the path that my dad had gone on. He still is practicing at almost 70 and he just loves dentistry. And so we practiced together for some time and I was loving it as well. It was my, you know, hobby as well as my profession. And then I got sick. Um, I didn't know why. And so I just started down all the traditional paths. I went to every doctor I knew and I knew quite a few being in the industry. Mm -hmm. I, you know, had MRIs, chiropractors, physical therapy, on and on and on and on. This was literally consuming my life. And uh, I was getting a little bit better and I found a lot of alternative care things, you know, improving my gut, improving my diet, all of those things. I I did everything and, um, I still wasn't well. And the problems were really impacting my career because I was having significant numbness. Um, I literally almost couldn't even hand hold the drill anymore when I was doing dentistry. My numbness was so bad. I couldn't sleep at night. It would wake me up all night long. And, uh, it was really bad along with memory issues. I've always had, you know, this is, this is your area of expertise, (laughs) but I've always had a really good memory. (laughs) And, uh, I would literally go from one room to the next room and not remember the patient's name that I'd just been working on. And that was so unlike me. I couldn't remember anything about everybody, but I couldn't remember anything about anybody anymore. So I knew something was wrong. So I actually had my practice for sale. I didn't think I was going to be able to continue. And um, I was starting to figure out, well, what am I going to do next? You know, I was literally in my mid-30s. 
So I couldn't just stop working. And um, the main breadwinner in my family, this just wasn't going to work. So um, I was talking to colleagues all over the country. And one said, you know, you sound so much like me. Have you looked into uh, mercury poisoning at all? And now I know, and not everybody does know this, but the silver fillings in people's mouths are actually 50% mercury. And not everybody knows that. And that's still true today. But, you know, I was confused. I said, I don't know why I would have mercury poisoning. I don't have any of those fillings. And he said, no, it's not the fillings you have. It's the fillings you've been drilling out every single day, breathing it all in without any protection. Wow. I'd never given I'd never given it a second thought. I didn't know that that could be a possibility or a problem. Dental school doesn't teach us anything about this. So I got tested. Sure enough, mercury toxicity off the chart. Oh, my God. So if I was going to continue practicing dentistry I and continue drilling out fillings, I had to figure out how to take them out without getting more into me. So it started me on this journey of finding out, okay, is there a different way? Is there a better way? And holy cow, did I find a lot of, a lot of things that nobody knows in dentistry, inside of dentistry, about the things that happen in your mouth affecting your overall health. And it has been such a life-changing journey for me to find these things. So I've gotten better. In fact, just yesterday, I told my husband, I said, man, I feel like my brain's back. I love this. But it's been, you know, eight years in the process of getting here. And um, the things I've learned and the people now we've been able to help has just been staggering. So, you know, it's often said that the biggest challenge gives you the, the biggest opportunity. It's definitely the case. And it definitely in my case, Absolutely. the truth. Absolutely. So if I understand correctly, I mean, these are feelings that people are, are getting put in every day. There's no other alternative that people can, I mean, to avoid having mercury in their mouths. There is an alternative. So if you, you know, you've probably heard of silver fillings, you know, dental silver fillings. Mm -hmm. Those have 50% mercury, but you don't have to have a silver filling. There are fillings made of resin um, that have been placed for years, you know, 20, 30, 40 years that are just fine and a perfectly good alternative or porcelain as well. So they can have alternatives, but oftentimes the dentists don't give them or they don't tell you that this could be a problem or you already have a mouthful. You know, a lot of people just have a mouthful from when they were kids and they don't realize that that's what they have in their mouths. Wow. Insane. And I mean, I guess it's not as bad if you only have the one compared to if you're drilling them out every single day? Or is it something, I mean, should everyone listening to this go out and get their de their dental fillings replaced? Oh, there's a long story here. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously the dental practitioner, whether it be the dentist or the person sitting next to them in the chair, you know, suctioning, we're at most risk because I get everybody's mercury. Um, if you're the patient in the chair having it drilled out, you get just your own. However, that's enough. You know, it, it's so interesting. There's so much talk about mercury and, and vaccines, about, uh, you know, if you break a, a thermometer that has mercury in it, you literally have like 10 steps and have to do this hazmat removal procedure. But people have these in their mouths every single day. We're walking around with them. We're chewing them. Mercury is being released every single chew. And nobody talks about it. Nobody's talking about this kind of mercury. So should everyone have their mercury fillings removed? Well, so I know you're all about neuroscience and things. Mercury is the most neurotoxic substance on the planet. It just is. And it, it, it uh, affects the brain exclusively, almost exclusively, particularly um, lobes that are involved with Alzheimer's, with memory loss. So this is right up your alley. Uh, there's so many problems with mercury. You know, you wouldn't go break a thermometer and stick it in your mouth. You know, there's no way you would do that. Mm -hmm. But it's in your mouth if you have a mercury filling. It's wow. in your mouth. And and there is there is science that has been around for 20, 30 years showing that that mercury is released every day. So it's interesting. In the United States, there's, there's different regulations in different countries. And some countries have banned these fillings completely. A lot of European countries have completely banned them. Other countries have just banned them in pregnant women, ch young children, um, you know, people who are developing. Uh, United States, there's no ban at all. And uh, so we can put them in any, anyone at any time. Wow. And um, But there are also dentists who lost their licenses saying things like, your health will improve if you get these fillings removed. So I can't actually say that if I want to keep my license. Wow. <laughs> so <laughs> what I can say is that 
Mercury is the most neurotoxic substance on the planet. Mercury is released from your fillings every single time you chew. Uh, Mercury affects your brain. It can influence uh, your risk for Alzheimer's. I can tell you all those things. But you have to go decide, is this something that I'm concerned about that I want to actually do for myself? So, yes, a little interesting legal uh, legal challenge here in the United States. Wow. Why are they even putting the mercury in there? Well, it was clear back in the 1800s, early 1800s, uh, dentists were, dentistry was often done by barbers because, you know, they leaned you back in the chair, you got a shave, you got a tooth, tooth pulled. Um, and these barbers were sick of pulling teeth because honestly, pulling a tooth is not that easy. So on anyone, on the dentist or the person getting the tooth pulled. Right. Um, so right. They, they figured out that they could mix uh, that liquid mercury, elemental mercury with silver shavings and it would make kind of a malleable material. They could... Uh, push it into teeth, into holes in teeth, and uh, kind of shape it up, and then it would harden. So it was a great material. The other people doing dentistry at the time were also doctors. There was no such thing as a dentist. So the doctors were very concerned about this because they knew that there was another profession using mercury. Hat makers at the time would rub mercury on fur, and that's how they would make felt. Mm -hmm. So all the big felt hats. Well, what the doctors knew is that mercury was literally making those hat makers mad. That's where the term mad hatter comes mm -hmm. from, is the hat makers were going crazy um, because they were contacting mercury all day long. So the doctor said, we don't think it's a great idea to put mercury in people's teeth. And the barber said, well, we're making money on it. We don't see any problem. We're going to continue. So in order to stay in the business, doctors had to start placing mercury fillings as well. And they've never ended. It's never stopped. They, I mean, they fill a tooth. Well, they fill a tooth. They actually stay pretty nicely. You know, 20, 30 years later, you can still have the same filling in your tooth, but it's still mercury. Whoa. Insane. So what else did you discover about oral health? Because the title of your book uh, is obviously very intriguing, Healthy Mouth, Healthy You. I've heard it said that your mouth is really the gateway for, and, and so much of your health is dependent on your mouth. Why is that? So a couple of different reasons. First of all, it's a gateway because we can see it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how, how often do people typically go to their doctor? Mm -hmm. You know, they don't go every year right. unless you're sick. For well, you know, for well, you know, there's well baby visits, but there's no well adult visits. <laughs> so you're not typically going to a doctor, but a dentist, you know, you go every six months. So it's a gateway because we can actually see it. And, but that's just the beginning. So there's an interesting book called The Hidden Epidemic. It's written by a doctor. He's an MD and a JD, which to me actually is really interesting. So he's a doctor and a lawyer because he's not going to say anything in this book that could not be legally proven, if that makes sense, because he's backing himself up. You know, he knows how to, he knows how to stay safe. So he has a quote that says nothing else comes close to having as large of a negative health impact as undiagnosed dental infections. That's from his book. He's an MD. And I agree hundred percent. I've heard other people say that about 80% of chronic disease actually either originates or is influenced by what's going on in your mouth. So this is not something to take lightly. And, uh, there's multiple multiple things uh, that go on here, but I want to share some quotes with, or some, some statistics with you. So heart attacks, this was a, a study done in 2017. They actually biopsied the clot that caused a fatal heart attack. So if someone had died from the heart attack, they could, took the clot out that had done, you know, had, had blocked the artery. Mm -hmm. And what they found is that 78% of those clots had bugs that were mouth specific. So very, very related to heart disease. Um, if you have one, if you have one or more root canals in your mouth, you have nearly a seventy five percent increased risk for heart disease. Cancer. If you have a root one root canal tooth, you have a two and a half times increased risk for cancer. In fact, there's a, a doctor in Germany that's found um, that for breast cancer. 70% of the people who had breast cancer had a root canal on the same side as the breast that was affected with cancer. Whoa. So this is, this is not talked about. People don't know that this is such a huge thing. And the problem is, is most everyone has had some kind of dental work. You know, there's 25 million root canals performed in the United States alone. So if you extrapolate that to the world, how many root canals are there? pretty much about 30 to 50% of the population probably has a root canal. So that means 35 to 50% of the population has an increased risk for cancer and heart disease because of that tooth. Um, it's all based on chronic inflammation, chronic infection. 
And it's sitting there in everyone's mouths every single day. Jeez. So this really is important to me because I, because of some dental work that didn't work, so to speak, uh, I ended oh. up going in and needing to have something replaced and, and discovering that I also had dental inflammation. And I went through this whole process of like deep cleaning and all this crazy stuff. Uh, it was awful. And so my question is, what do we do? I mean, how, how, how do we keep ourselves safe? Well, there's basically two things. There's prevention, which is huge. Mm -hmm. And then there's cleanup, cleanup, which is sometimes even bigger because there's so much that has to be done to clean it up. So um, let's go to prevention first. Prevention is actually quite simple. Uh, everybody talks about clean your teeth, brush your teeth. I mean, who doesn't know to brush their teeth, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody knows to brush their teeth. Everybody knows how to brush their teeth. There's actually $2 billion spent a year in just toothpaste advertisements. So everybody knows how to do this. Unfortunately, that's not the only piece. Now, I know you're really interested in health and, and um, how to keep your body healthy, how to keep your mind working. So dentistry is very much related to that. In the 1930s, there was a man named Dr. Weston Price. And if anyone's in alternative health care at all, they know the name Dr. Weston Price. What they may not know is that he's actually a dentist. He was a uh, concerned with the number of cavities he was seeing, particularly in children. So he and his wife decided to travel the world and go and visit indigenous societies or societies that hadn't been influenced by the modern diet yet. Uh, in the 1930s, they still found a few. So they went around and they visited these societies and they looked at their dental health and then they looked at what they were eating. And the cool thing about his research is that he had a camera. So not only is he able to document, you know, the things he was seeing, but he was able to, to take pictures of what he was seeing, pictures of the difference in mouths for even, even in the same family, one brother who was eating the traditional diet, one brother who had adopted the modern diet, mm -hmm. the difference in their dental health. It was huge. So uh, his research stands today pretty much uncontested as showing that nutrition is absolutely crucial to dental health. But the interesting thing about dental health is, again, it's just the gateway. It's just what we see. Obviously, dental health is the same as every other bit of us. <laughs> so if your teeth are healthy, your bones are healthy. If your gums are healthy, your gut's healthy and vice versa. So nutrition is absolutely crucial. And one of the things that's missing in today's diet, what people don't understand, is there's two kinds of vitamins. So you hear about vitamin C, vitamin B, those are what are called water-soluble vitamins. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the foods they're in, they're in like an orange, you know, so it's, it's, it's water, it's in, it's in an orange. But then there's the vitamins that are called fat-soluble vitamins. They're A, D, E, and K, and they're only located in fats. So you're going to find those in animal products, butter, um, fish oil. Uh, you're also going to find them somewhat in uh, plant fats, so avocados, uh, seeds, nuts. Well, people don't realize that you need both, that the fat soluble vitamins actually let the water soluble vitamins in and also unlock other, other processes that allow you to absorb other nutrients. And there's a lot of diets today that are leaving those fat soluble vitamins out. Oftentimes a vegan diet is very almost, almost impossible to get the adequate amount of fat soluble vitamins. Mm. So I see people who've, who've adopted a vegan diet and their teeth are trashed. And they don't know why. They think, oh, they're being so healthy and they're working so hard on diet. I mean, vegan diet's hard. I've done it for a little while. <laughs> you know, they're working so hard on it and their teeth are falling apart because they don't have those fat-soluble vitamins, which allow the body to uptake calcium, vitamin D especially, to uptake calcium to utilize it correctly. Wow. So prevention is eat a diet that has everything, that has everything, a little bit of everything. You can't leave anything out. Everything has to be there. You need lots of fruits and vegetables. You need things that contain those fats. So people will say, well, what if I don't eat meat? What if I don't eat animal products? What do I do? Well, it's a lot harder. Um, so I often encourage them, if they will, to do bone broth, to do butter, to do a butter oil, um, a fish oil, some of those things that have those fat-soluble vitamins in it. But it's really difficult. If you leave a complete, a complete vitamin set out of your diet, right. you're not going to be healthy. Wow. <laughs> you're just not going to be so nutrition is absolutely crucial. You can brush your teeth all you want, but if you're not feeding your body the building blocks in order to make that mouth and that body healthy, it won't work. 
So we talk a lot about diet every day. I'm talking about diet with people, especially in today's modern world. You know, sugar is a big, you know, it really is a big factor in the way our bodies work. And there's so many things that it does. People just think, oh, sugar causes cavities. Well, no, sugar actually influences the way your body uses calcium. So your bones are going to be weak. Your teeth are going to be weak. All these things aren't going to work very well if you have, if you're eating a lot of sugar. And that's today's modern diet, right? Pretty yeah. much sugar and everything. Right. Yeah, that's the prevention. That's the preventions. <laughs> there's there's so much here, right? There's so much, and, and I have specific so questions much. as well. But talk to me about the the cleanup side as well. So cleanup side is a little bit more work, but you need to see a dentist that's holistic minded, and really what that means is just someone who is focused on your whole body and realizes it's connected. And why people haven't thought about that, I don't know. You know, modern medicine has typically said, okay, we need a doctor for your ears, a doctor for your eyes, a doctor for your throat, a doctor for, you know, if you have bone problems, a doctor for your teeth. Well, we're all connected top to bottom. So somebody needs to be looking at all those pieces. So when you visit a holistic dentist, hopefully they're looking at root canals to see, do you have chronic infection at the end of those teeth? They're looking at wisdom teeth areas. This is a total new one for me. Oftentimes wisdom teeth areas that where wisdom teeth were removed harbor infection for 20, 30, 40 years. And wow. that infection is the, it's the one thing I see that causes chronic fatigue that causes people to come in and say, I need my life back. How do I get my life back? Let's look at your wisdom teeth areas. Oh, there's the infection right there. Who knew it doesn't hurt. You don't feel it. You don't even know it's there. And how many people got their wisdom teeth removed? Hmm. You know, in the United States, it's probably 80% of people get their wisdom teeth removed. So 80% of people could potentially have a chronic infection in their wisdom tooth areas. Um, all those, all those mercury fillings. And another sneaky one is if you have a crown on your tooth, it may look like a tooth, may look white, has porcelain over top, but it may actually have a metal core underneath. So you may have metal in that tooth then without even knowing it. So there's a lot of cleanup that has to happen. I focus on metals and infection. Mm -hmm. Any source of metals and infection in your mouth could cause all sorts of things um, down the road chronically, chronic disease. So I treat chronic disease. That's what we do in our practices, treat chronic disease, chronic infection, chronic illness. And it's amazing how much of it is because of the mouth. Wow. Crazy to me. So what do I mean? Do we just go into our dentist next time we have a checkup and say, hey, look at my root canals and, and metal? And I mean, what do we ask for? How do we advocate for ourselves here? Good question. So on my website, they actually, there's a quiz there that you can give or a 10 questions that you can ask a dentist to say, do you do this? Do you do this? Do you do this? And that's a great guide to take with you because, or to even call and, and ask the office, do you do this? Do you do this? The trouble is, is that most dentists don't. So there are organizations, worldwide organizations that do have members that are holistic based and in other countries outside of the United States, it's a little bigger than here where I live. So that's a good thing for you who live outside of, outside of the United States. Um, there's a dental specific x-ray called a CT scan, a cone beam CT scan. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing I would make sure your dentist has is a cone beam CT scan. That's what you have to have to be able to see infection at the end of root canals and infection in wisdom tooth areas. So to me, that's, pretty much a, a make or break. If they don't have that, then you need to find a dentist that does. All right, let's take a quick pause here to thank this episode's sponsor, Comrade Socks. For years, I've been a fan of compression socks, especially for long days of travel. The problem? Most compression socks are ugly, expensive, and uncomfortable, but not Comrade Socks. Their stylish compression socks are something you'll be proud to wear. Plus, they use medically proven and lab-tested true graduated compression and smart silver antimicrobial technology to keep your legs feeling and smelling great. To get 20% off on your very own pair, visit comradesocks.com slash superhuman or use the coupon code superhuman. That's C-O-M-R-A-D-S-O-C-K-S dot com slash superhuman. All right, let's get back to the episode. Wow. Okay, that's really, really good to know. I want to ask you about flossing because this uh, expert gum surgeon that I went to told me flossing is out and actually can cause more damage than uh, than good and actually that what I should be doing is using these special toothpicks to clean in between teeth. What's your thinking on that? 
The trouble with flossing is that it actually, well, there's a natural crevice around every tooth that the mm-hmm. gum sits up against. And we measure it. That's, I'm sure you had that done, right? Right. <laughs> Super oh, enjoyable. Yeah. Everybody loves to have six places on every tooth measured. Um, and typically that crevice is about two to three millimeters deep. That crevice is where infection starts. So if things get under the gum and stay under the gum, then infection starts to infiltrate the bone and the gum surrounding the tooth. The trouble with floss is that when you run that floss down, you're getting between that crevice and the tooth, and you're essentially opening it up. So once that area has been cleaned, I don't want you opening it up again every single day. Does that make sense? That's the trouble with flossing. So you're opening that area up to be more vulnerable to future infection if you continue to floss. So there are ways to clean that don't open that crevice up. And that's what I'm sure that uh, your dentist, your, your, your specialist was recommending were other ways to get food out without opening the crevice between the tooth and the gum. Very cool. So Very cool. You, you have a good one. You have a good one. Oh, you made I'm a really good glad. recommendation. I'm really glad to hear that. <laughs> Michelle, are there other things that we need to be doing to advocate for our dental health? I mean, um, There's just so much that goes on with our mouths. There's so much that goes on with your mouth. So, you know, the the starting point is to become educated yourself. And I've read every book on Amazon on holistic dentistry. (laughs) And I know that you're not I know that you're not going to. (laughs) So probably true. Heaven forbid if you do, because you're going to go way confused if you do. So what I would recommend is finding a very simple book. That's the reason I wrote my book is to be very, very simple. And you can take it just topically. So for you, you have gum infection. Sounds like uh, what you would do is you open the chapter on gum infection. It would give you the information you need to be armed, like you'd said, you know, to help advocate for yourself. Then you take that to your doctor and you say, do you know about this? Tell me about this. How am I doing? Is this, you know, how am I doing as far as health and wellness? Is this something that you think that there could be treatment for? So just educate yourself minimally. You know, everybody that's listening to you is well-educated. Information information is what they're interested in. So information is important, but you don't have to read all of it. Mm -hmm. Just read enough that you can have an educated conversation with your provider, you know, I I heard someone say a quote one time that just really resonated with me. I was talking about, okay, I'm, I'm in alternative healthcare now. You know, that's my realm, even though I was traditionally trained. And he looked at me and he said, what do you mean? He said, people have been treating their own health since the dawn of time. Mm -hmm. That's traditional healthcare. The way that modern medicine treats you is alternative. Yeah. And I really like that. So to me, Your health is dependent on you knowing a little bit, just enough that you can say, hey, I'm concerned about this. This book or this article that I read says that if my gums bleed, that's chronic inflammation. Tell me about that. What do you know about that and how could how could you help me? Yeah. So just enough. And, you know, I can tell you right now, if a patient shows up in my chair saying things like that, I'm in love with them Mm -hmm. because we can have an educated decision uh, conversation. And I know they're actually going to do what I say. They're going to go home. They're going to use those little pick things that you got, you know, I bet you use them, don't you? I do. I do (laughs) them in bed. (laughs) Exactly. Because you know now where it led you when you weren't doing that. You don't want to go there again. So take your health in your own hands. That's the biggest thing I see in advocating for yourself is just become educated enough to have a conversation with someone and don't be close minded. Mm -hmm. You know, the profession is really behind the public on this, really behind the public. Um, There was a documentary that came out in January called Root Cause. And um, it was gone. It it was on Netflix. And it was gone by about mid-February. It had been taken off the air Hmm. because it had been lobbied against by the American Dental Association. And um, the American Association of Endodontics. Endodontists are the ones who do root canals. And in this documentary, it talked a lot about root canals and the concern with, um, it it followed, the documentary followed uh, a gentleman who had had a root canal done in his uh, early 20s. And he, from that point forward, had ill health and had tried everything, everything, every alternative and traditional method to try and get better and hadn't been able to until he had finally had the tooth that had a root canal removed. Um, so this information is is not real great for a profession that relies on income from 
performing root canals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did a little math, figured out that there's 25 million root canals done in the United States alone. Each root canal costs about $1,000, and each tooth, once it's had a root canal, is recommended to have a crown, which costs another $1,000. So that's a $50 billion industry just in the United States. Wow. So that's not going to go down without a little bit of fight. Right. So, like I said, documentary was gone within about a month's time. <laughs> um, that tells you that the profession is not going to be the one that teaches you things. The yeah. dentists are not really interested in hearing this because it's really hard to change what you've been doing. And it's hard to admit that what you're doing perhaps could be harmful. Right. Um, nobody likes to, to say that or realize that. I didn't like to say that or realize that until I completely just took myself out of the equation and went, whoa, 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 it doesn't matter about me. It matters about what's important for my patients. And um, the dent, the profession isn't going to, they're not going to make this change because they want to, because they don't want to. I've gotten a lot of um, negative feedback <laughs> <laughs> because of my stances, in, because my stance in this area, I try to keep a little bit of a low profile and I try to keep it very science-based. And to me, that's safer. Um, but you, all of you that are listening, you're going to be the ones that drive this change. Right. You're going to be the ones that demand this, ask for this, look for this. Dentists are going to have to learn the answer somewhere because you're asking for them. And if you don't settle for something less than that, then they will adopt it as well. So really, this is going to be a public-led movement that uh, is already growing. I, I can't tell you how many people are interested in what we do and talk to me from all over the world and come and see us and read our information and, and it's resonating with them. And we're seeing life-changing stories happening because of cleaning up mouths. It's amazing to me. And, and what's so interesting and surprising is, you know, as you said, you, you've gotten a lot of negative feedback, as you delicately put it. And it, it blows my mind that you get the same kind of reaction that, you know, people talking about the Paleolithic diet get. And it, what you're saying is really not I mean, it's, it's very smart and it's revolutionary in its own way, but it's, it's really not controversial, right? It's like, get the unnatural crap out of your mouth. <laughs> you know, you shouldn't exactly. have mercury in your mouth, just like you shouldn't have Franken foods and you shouldn't be eating Twinkies. I don't understand what is so controversial about that. And, and why, you know, you have to be this voice of advocacy where you would think that the entire dental industry would be like, wait a minute, why, why are we, why are we doing this again? Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it, the message seems like time and time again, it's like stick, stick to what is natural and yep. clean and pure. Yep. Yep. And it's been interesting, the feedback that I have gotten from the profession. So I get very vocal opponents who aren't afraid to tell me how stupid I am, you know, and <laughs> then I get very quiet proponents who say, I'd love to learn more. So right. perhaps that's, the truth about all of these things, you know, the, the, the opponents are very vocal and the proponents are a little quieter. Um, and as long as there's quiet, the quiet proponents in the background asking, how can I do this? How, where do I learn more? Then I'm going to continue teaching and helping. And, and that's something I'm actually releasing tomorrow with your help, thankfully, uh, through, oh, awesome. through one of the courses that I've learned with you is uh, total care Academy, uh, launches tomorrow. And, uh, we have 12 beta doctors signed up to learn how to create this kind of practice. And in January, it will be released for anyone worldwide to learn how to create this kind of practice because you, all of you are going to be t asking your dentist for this and they're going to need to learn how, how to do it. That is awesome. Good for you. And just so people know, tomorrow is September 3rd. I don't know exactly when this episode is going to come yes, out, but September 3rd, <laughs> 2019. So by the time you hear this, you will be able to tell your dentist, have you gone through yes. Total Care Academy? And by then it will probably be a worldwide movement. So they will already know about it. But just in case. Yes, you know. thank you. Now, on the note of natural, one thing I also want to run by you, I don't normally fact check past guests, but we had uh, Trina Felber on the show a couple times, and she got me on, on the topic of natural, she got me on tooth powder instead of toothpaste, saying that a lot of the stuff in toothpaste is not natural, and tooth powder is just clay and charcoal and mint, uh, and I love it, and I want your permission to love it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have my permission because people will say, well, I don't eat my toothpaste. Well, you know what? Your gums do. So the gum tissue in your mouth is actually one cell thick and it's the only barrier 
between you and your entire circulatory system. There are things in toothpaste that you would never eat. There's triclosan, there's, um, which is a, basically an antibacterial agent that they put in hand soap. Would you, would you eat your hand soap? Of course not. And actually don't use that hand soap either. But um, <laughs> don't use it anything. But uh, you would eat it. There's uh, all sorts of things. There's surfactants. There's things that make it fizzy, you know, foam up in your mouth. Most of the things in toothpaste have nothing to do with actually improving your mouth health. They are mostly used to make it taste good, to make it foam up so that you feel like you've done a good job, or to um, make it so that you want to continue using it time and time again. They have very little to do with you. Speaking of, there's going to be a segue off of this about fluoride, so remind me to do that. Um, Yeah, but let's go. Let's do it. (laughs) Uh, Let's finish toothpaste and then we're going to go to fluoride. Um, But I love tooth powders. And there's also pastes that are very, very simple. Um, All you want to use is something with clay, just like you said, clay, water, maybe an essential oil in there. Charcoal's good Mm -hmm. because it actually oxidizes. So that's the thing that the charcoal is doing is it oxidizes um, and may whiten your teeth slightly. It makes your sink black when you spit it out. But (laughs) yes, it does. Uh, you're, the thing, my toothpaste, my toothbrush is always disgusting too. It's like all black all the time, but, um, but it's really good to oxidize. So throw away every single traditional toothpaste you have. The other thing it does is they have glycerin in it, which makes your teeth feel slippery when you're done brushing. So, you know, you run your tongue across and go, mm, that feels so good. Well, guess what the glycerin does? It actually seals your tooth. So it can't uptake minerals anymore. So it's harming your tooth to have them feel mm, so good. Uh, So you don't want a toothpaste that has glycerin in it either. So very simple. Thank you for using a tooth powder. I absolutely endorse it. Continue using it. Everyone should. Um, That's awesome. Do you have a preferred one? I really like the Primal Life Organics, but, but you're the pro. The Primal Life Organics is great. Um, I prefer a toothpaste over a tooth powder just because tooth powders, it, honestly, it's, it's kind of hard to navigate, isn't it? Like, what do you do with it? Do you pour it in your hand and then dip your toothpaste in that or toothbrush? It's a little hard to navigate. What I found is I put it in a little plastic baggie and then dip my toothbrush into that baggie. But again, I'm thinking, Ooh, how many germs am I putting in that whole bag? I don't know. But if you love powder, great. I love paste. My favorite paste is from a company called... Um, I just forgot the name, Redmond. Redmond, uh, it has uh, salt in it. It's called, um, that's the company, is, is a Redmond company. And I love the paste. And it's the, it's literally has uh, only, I think, an essential oil, some bentonite clay. That's about all that's in it. Very awesome. basic. That's what you want to look for. You can make your own too. I actually have a recipe on my site. You can find it online about how to make uh, your own toothpaste with your own. Well, that. That is easy enough. Now talk to me about fluoride. Here's the deal. Uh, I was having some real pain in an area of my mouth and, uh, and they started fluoriding me and I stopped getting pain, but I have a feeling that fluoride is not good for me. Okay. So fluoride is good for your tooth because what fluoride does is it actually substitutes the calcium in the crystal that makes up the enamel of the tooth. So it does make a stronger, more resistant crystal, which is why your pain went away. Okay. So you've just changed the crystal mm-hmm. and structure of the enamel of your tooth. Unfortunately, the fluoride doesn't just stay there in certain cases. In your case, if you're putting it right on that tooth and you're making sure not to swallow any, not to get any on your gums, then I'm okay with that. If you're brushing it on, then you may be getting under your gums and you're getting it internally. So let's talk about what it does internally. It creates a different structure, crystalline structure in the bones as well. It creates a stronger, more brittle bone. So when uh, a lot of times um, people are taking fluoride in their toothpaste, they actually have it in mouth rinses now. Um, There's other rinses that are just a fluoride rinse. They have supplements. Um, Fluoride is oftentimes in water. I don't know about where you are, but where I am in the United States, water is fluoridated in many communities. So people don't have a choice if they're drinking water out of the tap than to drink water or than to drink fluoride. Um, Again, it's good for your tooth, but it also makes a stronger, more brittle bone. So they've shown incidences where much higher rates of hip fractures in areas that are fluoridated in areas Mm -hmm. that have fluoridated waters, because you don't want a brittle bone. So you've now made bones more brittle. There's other things though. (laughs) Um, fluoride is what's called a halide. So this goes back to high school chemistry class. Uh, If you look on the periodic table, fluoride is right next to iodine, bromine, chlorine. They're all similar compounds. 
Iodine is what's necessary to activate your thyroid hormone, right? Most people know this. Iodine is very related to thyroid function. Well, fluoride and iodine compete for the same spot on that iodine, on that thyroid hormone, and fluoride is a bully. So if you have fluoride in your system, it will actually force iodine out of the thyroid hormone. It will look like an activated thyroid hormone. So if you go to the doctor and you get tested for thyroid problems, they say, oh, your, your lab tests are fine because fluoride is in the thyroid hormone. It looks like it's been activated, but it's, in, it's not usable by your thyroid. So they're calling this type 2 hypothyroidism. Because of fluoride usage, it's causing low thyroid issues in people and they can look completely fine on lab tests. Wow. The more fluoride, the more fluoride you have in your system, the less active your thyroid is. So that's there's there's a few things. <laughs> it also relates yeah. to, to brain health, and, and it's it's particularly damaging in developing children. Should not ever be used in a child. That's when it's most often used. Um, a lot of processed foods are made with fluoridated water because they were made wherever the plant was that made the food that made the food. If they had fluoridated water coming into that plant, then the, the food now has fluoridated water in it as well. So a lot of processed foods, particularly fruit juices that are reconstituted, have fluoride in them as well. So it's very difficult to get away from. So I always tell people, please do not use a fluoride in any product that you have put in your mouth, your toothpaste, your mouth rinse, nothing. Do not have fluoride in it and stay away from processed foods as much as possible, but also use a fluoride filter on your water source. So if you're getting it from the, you know, the city, from the faucet, use a, a filter that will filter out fluoride. Right, right. So that's, that's pretty congruent with everything that I had found. I was very happy to learn that when I moved to Israel, they do not fluorinate their water for exactly this reason. It but if I hear what you're saying, the once in a while, you know, go to the dentist, get your cleaning, they put the trays in, get the fluoride, that's actually a really good thing for your teeth. If it just stays right on your teeth, it makes your tooth stronger. Yep. Right. I mean, it, it, some of it bleeds onto the gums, but I think I get what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, that is really, really good to know. You know, I'm trying to think what else, but I think we've covered a lot of ground here and people have a lot of food for thought. I mean, it, we've kind of just turned their whole world upside down. Like the stuff you're brushing with is wrong. Don't floss. Your mm -hmm. dentist is a villain. And <laughs> <laughs> they just don't know. They just don't know. <laughs> totally. Totally. Michelle, I want to transition a little bit because I know we're coming up on time. What are some of the other things that you are doing to keep yourself performing at superhuman levels? Well, I've been part of your uh, mastermind group, which has been fabulous. And actually, some of the oh, things, you. you know, I, I think that in any group you're in, you really gravitate towards some things and other things they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily what you need. But uh, um, two things in particular that I've learned through yours, particularly Hal Elrod's um, Miracle Morning has been literally life changing for me. So, oh, so uh, it has been so amazing and it's something that I have really utilized in doing things like building Total Care Academy. Now I, I set myself a goal and I said, all right, I'm going to have this release September 1st. And I, I set that goal about a month and a half ago. And then I had the entire task of creating an online course, which I didn't know how to do, um, filming all the content, which I had to hire a videographer for, I mean, you know, on and on and on and on and on. And unless I had the, the space and time to sit down every morning and say, okay, What's going to happen today and how am I going to make that happen? It wouldn't have happened. Um, and wow. if I had to just set the goal and given my, myself a time frame, it wouldn't have happened either. So that's been a great thing. And then for me, I'm very, very um, – <laughs> I've always had gut issues. I think the mercury still plagues me that way. Uh, mercury mm. causes a lot of gut issues. Um, and so I just eat so – carefully. I guess that's a good way to say it. Cleanly, carefully. It's just, you know, I'm such a believer in food that's alive, food that's real. I talk to people about that all the time. If your food comes in a box, if it comes in a bag, if it, you know, doesn't, if it has ingredients that you don't know what they are, don't eat it. Just don't totally. eat it. <laughs> just don't totally. Eat it. I love that. It, it <laughs> reminds me of Michael Pollan's whole deal, you know, like eat, eat plants or eat food, mostly plants, not too much. Yep. It's, it's that simple. Yep. Eat real food. You know, actually, I have a really interesting piece. Michael Pollan was one of the ones that started me on my nutrition journey, actually. I've read all of his books, love them. We've listened to them out loud in the car, my husband and I, and we love awesome. them. 
but uh, I learned about a thing called an apostat. This is really interesting. So an apostat is literally this thing in your body that turns on if you're hungry, your appetite. Okay. You know, you're, you're the, it's like a thermostat, but it, it's an apostat. It tells you how hungry are you. And the apostat is looking for s- certain things. It's looking for vitamins. It's looking for minerals. It's looking for certain building blocks that it's missing in the body. So if you feed it things that don't contain any of those essential building blocks. So if you eat a whole bag of chips, let's say you ate an entire bag, your apostat still stays on and says you're hungry still because you didn't feed it the thing that the body really needs. So this is how we get fat by eating, you know, this is how we, we, and still stay full, still stay hungry. You know, we can say, people tell me all the time, but I'm hungry all the time because your apostat's still on. I've noticed that, and people that I feed tell me this as well. They say, my gosh, I get to like, I fill my plate. I get to three quarters of the way through my plate and I can't eat another bite because the Mm -hmm. food fills the body. The food turns the apostat off and says, you're done. You don't need it. You don't need to eat anymore. And so, you know, I've heard it said that we are the most undernourished, overfed population ever on the face of the planet. Yep. Overfed and undernourished. So you have to feed yourself food, (laughs) food that's full of nutrients in order to actually turn that apostat off. You'll stop eating. You won't want to anymore. You have enough. And then all of a sudden you're not overweight and underfed. Love that. I love that. Michelle, that is pretty much time for today. I, you know, it's a good episode when I don't get to ask you most of the standard questions. I do want to ask you, however, where can people reach out, learn more? Where should we send folks? Should they pick up a copy of the book? Should they send their dentist to Total Care Academy? Tell me more. All the above. Um, So yeah, the book is called Healthy Mouth, Healthy You. It's on Amazon. Um, There's a Kindle version. Um, You can, again, get it and use it like an encyclopedia a little bit. You know, the piece that that you need to know. Read that little piece. It's it's not too long. Um, It's easy to read. It's written for the consumer. Uh, You can find a lot of information on my website. That's uh, totalcaredental.com. Um, lots of information, lots of blog information, lots of nutrition information. I'm a little bit of a nutrition junkie. I'm actually uh, a traditional naturopath as well. So um, lots of information beyond just dental on there. I'm also starting a new program called Living Well with Dr. Michelle. Very excited about that. By the time this comes out, that may be all up and going as well. Um, and then please send your dentist to Total Care Academy and you can find it at totalcareacademy.com. So all of those places, my job is just to teach all of you and to help you teach other dentists as well. So I share so much information and I'm always happy to share more. Totally awesome. Michelle, thank you so much for coming on the show. Last question before I let you go. If people take away one big message from this episode and they carry it with them for the rest of their lives, what would you hope for that to be? Don't delegate your dental health or any health to someone else. It's yours. It's yours. Learn how to take care of it. Learn how to do it. And then find someone who is willing and able to do it the way that you have learned is the best for you because you are your own advocate. Brilliant. Michelle, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the award-winning Superhuman Academy podcast. For more great skills and strategies or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit superhuman.blog. While you're at it, please take a moment to share this episode with a friend and leave us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next week.